this morning we are delighted by your friendship and your support and also we are delighted by the visit of the Reverend Dr. Leonard Sweet who is uh, not only an important academic, he teaches at Drew University but also one of the leading and most influential voices in Christianity today on many subjects including the role of the church in this postmodern culture. I know he has an important message to share that will encourage us to think about our faith, faith differently and critically and we're excited because we're going to launch our Christian book club, our adult book club study tomorrow using his book as the study guide. So with no further ado, uh, Dr. Leonard Sweet. Grace to you and peace, sisters and brothers, and the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. We're all here. And all that we are is here, and I am delighted to be here. Good morning, choir. I think the choir deserves its own category. So it's really, they say the musicians are the preacher's preacher. So uh, thank you. And uh, I love that last song. I'd never heard it before. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. I, um, I'm here on one condition that Melody doesn't tell everything she knows about me. So uh, Melody and I go way back, and uh, it's great to see her, and great to, great to be with you. I, unlike Lewis, who went to Yale, I went to a seminary called Colgate Rochester Bexley Hall Crozer. Now, you may know a little bit about that seminary because it's the Crozer part is the one that Martin Luther King Jr. went to. And he was a graduate of the seminary. And so when I went there, it was kind of big in King stories and, and he was a very important figure in my theological education. So I thought I'd begin this morning with a, a King story that you may not have heard. And this is one that not a lot of people know about. Martin Luther King Jr was asked once in his life, only once, to teach a course. So he taught one course. Now if he'd lived longer, I'm sure he would have taught a lot more, but this is the only course he ever taught in his life. And his alma mater, anybody know where King went to college? Morehouse College in Atlanta. Morehouse asked him to come back. The president was a friend and said, will you come back and teach a course in social philosophy? So he said, okay. I'll do it. So they flew him in every week, and, and uh, he taught this course. It was open to the entire student body at Morehouse, and eight students signed up. Now, just let me pause there for a minute and imagine if um, Bard College were hosting Martin Luther King Jr. It was open to the student body. How many would sign up? Six men, two women. So these are the only people in the entire world that can say what? We were students of Martin Luther King Jr. They're the only people in the world that can say, King was my, my mentor, my professor. It's an elite group, and they know they're an elite group, and every couple of years they have a reunion. It's hard to keep the memories green, you know? And, and so they get together and they congratulate each other. We were the only ones that had the good sense to take this course. And they, they celebrate and they pat each other on the back. And at the same time, they wring their hands because not one of them saved the syllabus. <laughs> King required two papers, which he passed back after marking up extensively. And not one of them saved one of those papers. By the way, a king signature now, just on a receipt, I think starts at $10,000. Just as... Not one of them took a picture. Not one of those eight students, and they admit this, shamefully, has any evidence they ever took the course other than the fact that they're in the official register and king assigned them a grade. Now, I begin with this story because one of the worst things you can say about anybody is that greatness passed them by and they missed it. I mean, I think back, back in my own life, and I had a chance once to go hear Louis Armstrong. It was a free ticket. 
And for some reason, I had something better to do. Can you imagine? I mean, I could have heard, I mean, Louis Armstrong, and I had something better to do? One of, one of the worst things you can say about anybody is that they missed their moment. And this is my challenge as we begin today. Um, because this is one of my fears. There's only one continent in the world where Christianity is not growing. And it's North America. I just came from, two weeks ago, I was in Indonesia. You go, Indonesia? And the second largest city is Surabaya. Um, I was at a church there with 130,000 members. The largest Muslim nation in the world, where Christianity is exploding, some places openly like in Surabaya, some places underground like in Jakarta. But what, what, is, what is our challenge? What is our problem? And this is and I think we're at the heart of it, is that we're missing our moment. Now, let me just be honest, I love driving in here to Rhinebeck this morning, because I, I'm, this is not the moment I have picked, okay? This 21st century, with all these 22nd century kids, you know they're 22nd century, right? You know, a child born today will be 88 and 2100. That'll be middle age. In, in 1890, the average male had a life expectancy of 37. 1990, the average male had a life expectancy of 74. Now it's already 78. The fastest growing segment of the population in the U.S. are centenarians. People over 100. In fact, there's a big debate now. There's a new category, super centenarians. Are they 105, 110? That's the big debate among gerontologists. Th these kids, this church is norming and forming faith in 22nd century kids. How you doing? Now, see, again, this is not the moment I've picked. I, I'm, my PhD is in, in cultural studies, and religion, and history, and um, I'm a Victorian person. My favorite, and that's why I do my academic research, is in the Victorian age. I love Victorian. I love all these, these beautiful Victorian homes with the wraparound porches that girdle on some of them girdle the whole house. I mean, I just, this is my, I doubt an Abbey. Can I get a witness? No. I mean, it's, it's my favorite show. I can't wait for January. The third season is coming. I mean, I just, come on. Oh, man. I just have doubt an Abbey. Um, it just, days where I just do nothing but watch the two. I mean, this is the time. I love this time. My wife and I, we live on a little island up in the Pacific Northwest called Orchids Island. And we have this 2,000 square foot house, this little house right on the water. And, and we have stuffed it full of Victorian antiques. Now, that's not easy to do because Victorian antiques are big car. You come into our house, you step into a time warp. You know, when you go back into the Victorian age. And, and I love that period. In fact, we even keep Victorian rituals, although most important, which is two desserts. Yeah. <laughs> you, gotta try, you gotta try both. You have to eat them all. But, you gotta... but here, here's, here's the problem, church. You get to pick your furniture. You get to pick your architecture. But you don't get to pick your moment. I'm going to sound like a good Calvinist this morning. But in the sovereignty and providence of God, God has chosen you and God has chosen me to reach out to a 21st century world with 22nd century kids. I, I, I appreciate you inviting somebody from another tribe. Um, I come from the Methodist tribe. And I looked at your, um, in your handbook, and you make me feel right at home because the very first song in your index is one written by the founder of my tribe, John, Charles Wesley. And it's a song um, 
that goes like this, a charge to keep I have. Anybody? You ever sing that Methodist song here? Okay, you didn't know it was a Methodist song. A charge, number 448, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. Here's the second verse. To serve this present age. Our calling to fulfill. And may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. See, one day you and I are going to have to give an account of ourselves. As to how well we fill our trust. God has entrusted to us this mission of reaching out to this culture. And see how it's going to work for me. But, you know, I didn't really like that world you gave me. You know, I really didn't like it. I, I preferred the, the 1950s. Or I preferred the 1890s. So I reached out to the 1890s really well. And, and it, but, you know, let me tell you, I'm, I'm having trouble. See, this is the world I grew up in. This was a Bible. I'm a good Gutenberg person. That's a Bible. Now, you got a lot of books. Not all books are Bibles, but I'm used to the Bible being a book. Now suddenly I'm in a world where this is a Bible. In fact, i got 26 Bibles in here, so if you ask me to swear on a stack of Bibles, I'd do it a lot easier on this one. <laughs> See, I was born B.C. Before cell phones. <laughs> All my kids are born A.C. After cell phones. And, and, and I'm having trouble figuring out how to. I'm used to reaching this world. Now, now I, gotta, I gotta find out a way. Now, media is not a zero-sum game. So I mean, I'm still writing more books than ever, and I, I, I love the one you're reading because it's my 50th book. I mean, that what matters most is my 50th, so I appreciate you doing that. But, but by the way, what's the number one website? What does it sell? Books. So, uh, by the way, how's your paperless office doing? <laughs> See, the more digital we get, the more we're drowning in paper. No, it's not a, it, it's, it's not a zero-sum game, but, this is the world we got to start reaching out And um, I, I'm, I'm still struggling with it because I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to do it. And, and, but I, you know, one thing I've learned, you used to have kids to work the fields. Now you have them to work the electronics. <laughs> and so one of the things we got to do, what I'm finding I've got to do is I've got to sit at the feet of my children. And I've got to learn from them. This new, this new culture that is forming all around me. Now, here's, here's the biggest challenge that we have. Um, the first thing a missionary does before they go to any culture. Okay, I have a friend who was a missionary in Egypt for six years. I say, no, you're a missionary in Egypt for four. He says, no, I was a missionary in Egypt for six. So we have this wonderful debate. He's really right, and I'm going to let him know that. But... He was only in Egypt for four years, but he's really right. He was a missionary in Egypt for six years because what did he spend the first two years doing? Learning the language. Okay. And, and this is our biggest problem. We gotta learn the language of this culture, how it speaks, how it communicates, because it's a very different language than this one. And I learned how to speak this language. This is the language of words. Now I, I'm in this world and I gotta, I gotta learn to speak this language. And it's no longer words. Advertisers do not spend billions of dollars a year to give you and me words. This culture communicates in stories and in images. That's a whole different world. In fact, I mean, why do you watch the Super Bowl anymore? It's not just for the football game. You can have a bad football game because you're still watching it. Because there's another competition going on. And the other competition are the commercials. 
The one that won in 2011, some of you may remember it, was the Darth Vader VW commercial. Do you know, how many of you remember that? Okay. Did you know there was not one word to the whole commercial? It was wordless. They told the whole thing and they won the show just by story. Just by these images that were connected in a story. Now the commercial, everybody's talking about. How many of you know, you have a Chipotle around here? Or anybody know what Chipotle is? Some of you know, know what it is at least, okay. If you go on the web and just do Chipotle commercial, Back to the start. You don't even know back to the start. It's, it's one all the way. Some say it's the greatest commercial ever made. It's less, than, it's just a couple of minutes. And the unique thing of it, you got Willie Nelson singing Coldplay. If you can guess that one. No words. It just tells a story. No. Right here. We translate logos, this great Greek word that has such incredible meaning. Logos, we translate it as, in the beginning was the, see, that's how we translate logos. But it could easily just as well mean voice, sound, or story. In the beginning was the, this is the greatest story never told. And that's our problem. We don't know the Bible as a story. We know it as verses. That's how I access the scriptures. I, I, um, my mother taught, I'm a PK. My pre, the preacher in my household was my mother. Uh, my mother was ordained in this little little group, Mennonite group like called Pilgrim Holiness and they looked just like Mennonites except the pilgrims didn't wear the sin sifters other than that it looked just the same. But when I got age five we had to start memorizing Bible verses every week. Anybody here have to memorize Bible verses? You reformed didn't do sword drills did you? You know, sword drills. Okay. That's a Methodist thing I guess. But that's how I learned the Bible in verses. But see the Bible wasn't written in verse. That, the, you don't have chapter and verse until the Protestant Reformation. And King James is the one that divided the Bible up into chapter and verse. Over the course of my life, I realized, so you've memorized all these Bible verses, but you've never once memorized an entire Bible story, have you? See, even how we access the Bible is through words. Slice thy is not a story. And the key to this culture is they, they are telling stories. Every commercial tries to suck you into a story so that you will go enter into a relationship with that story. Because, see, nobody who's selling anything in this culture is selling a product. They're selling a story and a relationship. I tell my kids they don't believe me, but the first cell phone came out in 1973. Martin Cooper? Anybody know who Martin Cooper is? See, you all, how many of you know who Alexander Graham Bell is? <laughs> Why don't you know who Martin Cooper is? See, we're all Gutenberg people. Now we're in a Google world. Or I call it a TGIF world. Doesn't mean, thank God it's Friday. It means Twitter, Google, iPads, Facebook. I mean, who would ever think I'd come here this morning how many of you have iPads? Okay, about half of you. Um, you know, two years ago, May, there was not an iPad in the world. Did anybody know? And we got Apple iPad tickets. I don't know what they are. I can get my own? Okay, but I'm coming here and we get Apple. There, there was no iPad in the world two years ago. That's how fast things are moving. Um, now, the first cell phone that Martin Cooper invented in 1973, it didn't look like this. Anybody remember what they looked like? They came in a body bag. <laughs> you had to carry them up. When you went to lunch, you had to make an appointment for your cell phone because you had to 
their reservation too because you just couldn't put it on the, on the table. It was so huge. And I was a late adopter. I didn't get one of the early ones. It wasn't until the late 80s that I got my first cell phone. I tell my kids this. My first cell phone cost $940. Can anybody give me a witness? I'm not the only one there, right? It's all good. Okay. Yeah. Now, now forget the, you know, the iPhone. Um, now you can get a cell phone for free. See, because nobody who's selling a product is selling a product. Nobody selling anything is selling a commodity. Everybody who is selling anything is selling two things. They're selling a story that tries to draw you into a, a relationship. And if you don't think when you get a cell phone, you just purchased a relationship trying to get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta hire a divorce attorney to get out of these relationships. You gotta have a relationship with your cell phone providers lasting longer than some marriages. It's not a little um, This is a culture that communicates in story and then Trying to be something else, somebody else. Broken relation with each other, broken relation with creation. And this whole story from Genesis to the maps is a story of God's attempt to repair and redeem those four broken relationships. In fact, God tries everything, God even tries a flood. When Asian cultures, is called, they call it God's tears. God just couldn't stop crying because of our rebellion and our refusal to be in that relationship. And, and finally, God tries a covenant. God tries a king. God tries a temple. God tries everything. Finally, God says, okay, I just got to have to step in. So God sent us what? Jesus. Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? What's God's middle name? With. God with us. And 
Jesus repairs and redeems on the cross those four broken relationships and brings us back into that garden relationship. And how do you know? By the way, who's the first person Jesus appeared to? Mary? Did she recognize him? No. Who did she think he was? The gardener. We're back in the garden. Now, I'm going to end here, but I, I want to end with courage, excitement, hope. Because I think our best days are the future of the church. If we can know our moment and not miss it. If we can live out of our tradition, not in it, but out of it. And if we can trust the Holy Spirit to move us into this 21st century with these 22nd century kids. You all know the seven last words of the church? Anybody? We never did it that way before. <laughs> and I want you to hear the seven first words. This is the last thing you're here for me this morning. As I challenge you to reach out to this mission field that God has given us. They come from the text that Lewis read, or Melody read for us, uh, from Philippians 4. And um, whatever Bible you have, if you turn with me just real quickly, because I want to I want to give you my translation of this. Because Paul, remember, where's Paul writing this from? Anybody remember where Paul is when he's writing these words? He's in prison, exactly. So he, he is in prison. And um, he's telling, look at verse 4 here. Rejoice in the Lord always. And, it, and it, just because he wasn't sure that we got it the first time. Again, I say, come on, smile, you all. I mean, rejoice. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Now, look where he's moving here. He wants to move us towards how do you get to the peace of God which passes all understanding, surpasses all understanding. That's verse 7. We'll guard your hearts and guide your minds in Christ Jesus. But how do you get there? I'm going to give you my translation of the Greek, all right? It's just as good as anyone that you all have even though he probably got better Greek classes at Yale than I got. But anyway, here's my translation of Greek. Be anxious in nothing. Be prayerful in everything. Be thankful in anything. Then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and guide your minds in Christ Jesus. Now let's replay be anxious in what? Nothing. Nothing. But then there's this second little. Be prayerful in. See, that's the meat of the sandwich. Pray without. Yeah. But here's the hard one. That's why it's last. Because you've got to do the first two before you can get to the third one. Be thankful in any. You want to get to the peace that passes all understanding? Here's how you do it. Be anxious in nothing. Be prayerful in Be thankful in Then the peace. Now, I've got down to seven words. And I use it as a mantra. And I will say sometimes this 20 times a day. Depending on what, if I'm stressed out, if I'm anxious about something, I just, I just go into my zone. And this is my mantra. My seven first words. Anxious, nothing. Prayerful, everything. Thankful, anything. Peace. Anxious, nothing. Prayerful, everything. Thankful. That's the hard one. Thankful. Peace. Can you all say it with me? Anxious, nothing. Prayerful, everything. Even the guy.
God chose you and me to serve this present age, this 21st century world, these 22nd century kids. There's only one way I can do it. There's only one way you can do it. There's only one way Ryan Beck Reformed Church can do it. Anxious. Continue our journey of growth and knowledge and faith. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn.